We live on the cutting edge of physics, material science, engineering, and nanotechnology. Because at Lockheed Martin, we're engineering a better tomorrow. Hi, everybody. How's it going this morning? All right. How many, how many future astronauts? Do, oh, I see two right there. How many other future astronauts in the crowd? All right. Well, this is going to be great then. I'm going to try to show you a little bit about what it's like to be an astronaut because I grew up wanting to do the same thing my whole entire life. This is a picture. Anybody know what we're looking at here or maybe where the picture's from? Yell it out. It's a picture from space. Yeah, it's actually a picture from the International Space Station. And right here, that's actually where I grew up, northern Maine. You can see the kind of characteristic shape of Martha's Vineyard down here. And all the way up here, that's where I grew up in a, in a town, a very small town called Caribou, Maine. And from the time that I was five years old, my mom says, I started saying I want to be an astronaut. So probably like some of you guys. And I just kept saying it my whole entire life. So I tried to involve myself in any kind of space-related activity that I could, anything that I, that I read about or found out about. Here's a picture of the first time that I was weightless for these small, like, only 30 to 35 seconds in the airplane that achieves microgravity that we have at NASA. But I'm going to take a little bit of a step back from space for a minute just to show you a little bit about how I got to where I am today because there are many, many different paths toward achieving your dreams, and this is just an example of the way that I did it. Like I said, I was fascinated about space. I wanted to be an astronaut since I was really small, but I was also fascinated with the world around me. I saw all these amazing animals accomplishing these incredible behaviors. I lived in this small town in northern Maine surrounded by the trees and nature, and that was really important to me. And I was really interested in all of these animals and trying to understand how they could do the extraordinary things that they could do. So for example, everybody, everybody loves penguins almost as much as astronauts, right? Who doesn't love penguins? This is an emperor penguin. They live in the Antarctic, and they are really interesting to me because they're the best diver of any bird. They can hold their breath for 30 minutes. So imagine the whole time I'm going to be talking to you today if you held your breath for that entire time. Don't try it, because I don't want you to pass out. I want you to listen today. But they could do it quite easily. So I was really interested in their diving behavior and trying to understand, you know, they're holding their breath, they're air breathing breath hold divers just like you when they're swimming underwater and they need to catch fish, they need all of their food lives in the ocean. But how do they do it? How can they hold their breath for 30 minutes? So we would actually go down to the Antarctic every year to work with these penguins. And when you see them swimming underneath the water, it is like a ballet. They're so graceful. And it's like this well-choreographed production where they're swimming around and performing above you. So we would actually put these little backpack recorders on them. It was kind of like getting them ready for their first day of school. We put their little backpack on, and we set them free, and they would swim and dive under the water. And we could learn all about how deep and how long they were diving and what was happening with their bodies. We could look at things like their heart rate, how they were using oxygen, and try to understand how they could do the things that they do. And I was lucky enough to get to dive down there, too. I love scuba diving, and so this was one of the most amazing places to dive. I also worked with this seal. Anybody know, know what kind of seal this is? Anybody? They live in California. They're called elephant seals. They're those really big ones. The males have those really big noses, and they fight the other males on the beach when they're establishing their territories during mating season. So this animal even, even can dive even longer than an emperor penguin. Take a guess. How long do you think that this one can dive? What do, what do you think? 45 minutes, good guess, two hours. Two hours, like imagine watching an entire movie while holding your breath, and they can do that. So we would put these different instruments on them and we would try to understand more, just like the penguins, about more about why they could do that. What was, what was special about them? How did they adapt in order to support that? And then I worked with this bird. This is a goose. You've probably seen lots of geese around, no matter where you live. But this is a very, very special goose. It's called a bar-headed goose because it has those two bars on its head. And this is a goose that flies over the tallest mountains on the planet. It actually migrates twice a year over the Himalaya Mountains, the tallest peaks on our planet. So they're not holding their breath like if they're diving. 
but they are flying at an altitude so high, there's really not very much oxygen up there. So again, we were really interested in how can they do that? What is special about them that can make them do that? So for this experiment, I wanted to fly these birds in a wind tunnel so that we could measure all these different things and study them in this kind of controlled way. But how do you get a wild animal like that to fly in a wind tunnel? You know, that would be like taking a wild animal out from nature somewhere and putting it on a treadmill. It would be really difficult to do. So we took ad advantage of this instinct called imprinting. Does anybody know what that is? Has anybody ever raised chickens or, or geese? You know, the first thing that they see when they come out of their egg, they think is their parent. So I actually raised 12 goslings. These little babies, they thought that I was mom and they would follow me around everywhere and they would come and cuddle with me and they would cry when I left them. But that made them really, really comfortable with me so that we could train them to do what we, what we wanted to do for our experiments. And the idea was to get them to fly in a wind tunnel. But before we could get in the wind tunnel, I actually had them outside with a little motor scooter and they would be flying next to me because they were my babies. And just like you guys don't want to be without your moms, sometimes. They didn't want to be too far away from me, so they would be flying right next to me, and it was so cool because this animal would be flying so close to me that sometimes its wing would be brushing the tip of my shoulder, and I would be looking in the eye of this flying bird who also happened to be my baby, so it was a pretty cool experience. But the idea was to get them to fly in the wind tunnel, and so we did. So this is a video of that. This bird is flying in a wind tunnel at about 45 miles per hour, so you know, when you're driving in your car going that fast, this is in slow motion, so it doesn't really look that fast. And I'm up here clapping and kind of encouraging the bird to keep flying, and I'm making my undergrad student do all the hard work. She's holding those tubes so that we can collect data. The bird's actually wearing a mask so that we can collect the air that it's breathing out, and we can also change the air that it's breathing to make it simulated like it's high altitude, like they were when they're flying over those high mountains. And then again, they had those little backpack recorders on so we could understand their, how fast is their heart beating when they're doing this? How does the oxygen level change in their bodies? And this, this video, this goose is actually flying at 10.5% oxygen. Now, you guys have probably had some of you are old enough to have had some science classes where you know, anybody know how much oxygen is in the air right now that we're breathing? Almost, about 21%. Yeah, about 21%. And this is 10.5%. There's only half the amount of oxygen, but these birds are still able to do that because they have all these special adaptations. So I hope you're really interested in these animals like I was. You know, I'm so interested in this remarkable diversity in the animal kingdom, but I'm not wearing this suit today, and they didn't ask me to come talk about animals. So I'm probably, do you guys want me to talk about space a little bit too and being an astronaut? All right, okay, so I'll get into that. So in 2013, even though I was really happy doing the things that I was doing and working as a scientist with these really cool animals, I actually had my childhood dream come true, and I was selected to be an astronaut with these seven other amazing people. And we reported to NASA in August of 2013, and that was the first time that I got to put on this blue flight suit. And I put this picture in there because, you know, this is this kind of iconic thing that you guys think about when you see astronauts, and I thought about it my whole life. And when I met astronauts, I would see them in this, and they would be talking to kids just like I'm doing now. And now it's, it's really hard to believe that I'm the one wearing the blue flight suit up here today. And so, you know, that might, this might be you in a few more years, too. So when we started in 2013, we were what's called astronaut candidates, affectionately known as ASCANs. And for two years, we learn about five main things. We learn how to fly airplanes. We learn all about the various systems on the International Space Station. We learn how to fly the robotic arm on the space station, kind of like playing a video game. I'll show you what that's like. We learn all about how to do spacewalks, wearing the big space suit that I know you've seen pictures of. And we actually learn Russian, because everybody on the International Space Station has to speak both English and Russian. So I'm just going to show you a bunch of pretty pictures, and you're going to see what it's like to learn and do all these things, what it's like in the daily life of being an astronaut. So I always wanted to fly airplanes as well. I was really interested in flying airplanes. And so even way before I was an astronaut, I was a private pilot, and I used to fly small airplanes like this one. But when I became an astronaut, I got to go to, Navy, to the naval base in Pensacola and get more intense flight training before 
before going back to Houston. And so we flew this aircraft called the T-6. The T stands for a trainer in any military aircraft. And so you can see how happy I am. It was almost like a little bit of a dream within a dream to go to, to the Navy and learn how to fly with them for seven weeks. But the idea was we would gain all of that experience and then take it back to Houston where we fly these airplanes. They're called T-38s. There's a couple of actual, there's a jet actually downstairs. It's different, it's not a T-38, but there's some amazing stuff. I hope you guys have been down there. There's even some flight simulators where you can learn how to fly these airplanes too. So I'd encourage you to check that stuff out downstairs. Once you learn how to fly these airplanes, you can start taking these kind of, you know, cool kid photos like this one, or maybe even some cockpit selfies. But I promise I wasn't flying at the same time as I was taking this one. Another thing that we do is learn all about the International Space Station, because this is what's going to be my home. Hopefully in the next couple years, I'm going to be launching up to the International Space Station and living there for about six months. You guys, have you learned about the International Space Station in school, or you maybe you've seen some stuff on TV? So the International Space Station, this is what it looks like. End to end, it's about as big as a football field. And you can see it has these solar arrays to provide power. It has this big truss segment, which really everything else is based off of. There are radiators for cooling. And these are the main habitable structures. So this is in orbit above us right now. It is going around the Earth every 90 minutes. And there are six people up there. We've had a continuous presence on the International Space Station for over 17 years now, way longer than most of you have even been alive. We've had humans living up there. And not just Americans, but also the Russian cosmonauts, Japanese, European, and Canadian astronauts, too. We're all working up there, living together, and we're all doing science. The most important part of our job is that we're doing all these different kinds of scientific experiments, ranging from biology, chemistry, physics, material science, anything that you've seen today, you name it, we are up there doing that research on the space station. So we have to, we're going to be up there living for six months, so we have to learn all about the different systems so that when stuff breaks, we can fix it. Because what do you guys do if your toilet, you know, you have a problem with your plumbing, your toilet breaks, or you need to change a light bulb? Maybe your mom or dad can fix it. Maybe you have to call a plumber or an electrician or a specialist. Well, we can't do that in space. When the toilet breaks, and it breaks a lot, we have to be able to fix it. And so that's what you can see. Some of my classmates are here. They're actually fixing the toilet. That's what this pic picture is. They're learning how to fix the toilet. This is a picture from the cupola. These are that, that whole, um, there's all windows on all sides. And that's where you see all these amazing pictures that have been taken and videos that have been taken from the space station. Another thing that we learn is how to fly this robotic arm. So this is a big robotic arm that's on the International Space Station. It's called the Canada Arm because the Canadian Space Agency built it. And it moves around in all these different joints. And so we actually fly it from within the space station. So that's what astronaut Karen Nyberg is doing here. You have these little controllers and these screens and she's flying it around. And you guys like video games? Yeah, it's a little bit like, like playing a video game. And I actually didn't play that many video games when I was little, so I didn't know if I was going to really like it, but it's a lot of fun. And it's also, it's a really cool experience. You have to be really careful as well because your friends actually might be out here on the end of the arm, so you've got to fly it really carefully so that you get them to where they need to be. I also mentioned we all take Russian. Do you guys speak any foreign languages? Study some languages? That's great. It's really great for you. Yeah, so we, everybody up there, like we said, we have all these different countries, and that's one of the really coolest parts of, of the job, because we're living there, we're making friends all over the world. So we have, everybody up there has to speak both Russian and English. And you know, for us, Russian's a pretty hard language to learn, but it's a lot of fun. Imagine if you're a Japanese astronaut, you have to learn both English and Russian in order to get to the space station, so they have it even harder than we do. And lastly, I saved this one for last, because the spacewalking part, that's the coolest part of the job. I mean, other people in other professions get to fly jets, and other people study languages and take engineering classes. But you know you're an astronaut when you put on that flight suit and that, and that space suit. And I'll never forget my first time in there. So you know, this is a really complex thing to learn how to use, because you weigh over 400 pounds when you're in this giant thing. So how do we replicate that? You know, we don't, we don't have weightlessness here on Earth, so how do we practice to do a spacewalk? 
Well, the engineers at NASA were really clever when they came up with this system of doing it underwater, where, of course, you still have gravity, but if you adjust the floats and the way you're floating in the water, it does kind of recreate a little bit of what it's like to be in space. So we have this giant pool at NASA in Houston. It's called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, and it's one of the biggest pools in the world. It's 40 feet deep, it's 100 feet wide, and 200 feet long. And underneath the surface of the water, we have this whole mock-up of the space station. So a whole, it's real life size. We have the space station down there so we can practice our spacewalking and learn how to use the spacesuit. And I'll never forget the first time I got to put it on. So you have all these people around making sure that you're getting in there and everything's safe and configured correctly. And they put, the first thing you do is you put the pants on. And then you, because you weigh over 400 pounds in this thing, you can't walk around in it. So it's actually mated to this big frame. So I'm stuck to it right here. I've put my pants on, then you crawl up underneath into the torso, and then you're stuck to this big frame. And then they put the helmet on, and then they put the gloves on, and they put all the tools on you, everything strapped to you, because what happens if you let go of something when you're in space? It might float away, so you have to keep it tethered to you. You know, you basically have like a long string attached to it so that you make sure that you don't lose any tools. And we practice underwater in the spacesuit. And I'll never forget that first time that I was in the spacesuit and I was concentrating so much on what I was doing and I was thinking, please don't let me make a mistake. Please don't let them think that they picked the wrong person. And I was so focused on what I was doing that I just you know, was really concentrating on using this tool. And I looked up because we always do this with another astronaut. So we do it with, a, I was with my classmate, Josh. And I looked up at Josh and I stopped for a second. I thought, oh, that's so cool. Look at Josh, he's in a spacesuit. And then I was like, wait a minute, so am I. So sometimes, you know, you get so caught up in what you're doing, you forget to take a step back and really appreciate it. So I'll remind you to do that. And we do lots of other uh, lots of other types of training as well. We go on hiking trips together to learn survival training. Uh, here's an example. We're building shelters out in the woods. And this is actually is in my home state in Maine. So it was a lot of fun for me to be kind of, for me, it was kind of like vacation. I love hiking and camping, and it was in my home state. So it was a lot of fun to go back. We learned a lot of really valuable skills. We learn a lot about geology and geology training to learn more about our planet, to help us with our observations, looking back on Earth when we're up there and in the future, hopefully when we explore other planets, we learn all these techniques in order to do that. We got to go in, the, in this airplane again with these periods of weightlessness, affectionately known as the vomit comet, because it makes a lot of people feel sick, but I never got sick on the airplane. You get to kind of fly around like Superman. And since I haven't actually been to space yet, I haven't been weightless except for in this airplane, but it's a lot of fun. That first time that you're in it, you really feel, you know, the, the first time your arms start lifting up on that very first parabola, and it feels in your insides too, kind of like when you're on a roller coaster. You know, you feel kind of everything come up like that, but this lasts for about 35 seconds, so it's a lot of fun. And another really important thing that we do as astronauts at NASA is exercise. This is a really important, I'm sure you guys learn about this in school and your family say it, because in order for you to stay happy and healthy, you really need to do a lot of physical activity, right? It's really important. And it's even more important in space, because without gravity, you know, when you're sitting here in your chair, even if you're not, you don't feel like you're exercising, but you have this force of gravity kind of pushing you down in your chair, and that is actually stimulating your bones and muscles and keeping things healthy. But if you're in space and you don't have that force anymore, your muscles start shrinking and your bone, the density actually decreases, and so we have to do a lot of exercise in space in order to keep ourselves happy and healthy so that when we come back, we can still walk around. And so this is this really special, so if you're in space, everything's weightless. So how can you lift weights? I mean, I can take a 50-pound weight or a 100-pound weight, and it's, it's not going to do anything in space if I try to lift it like this. So the engineers at NASA had to develop this really special piece of equipment, and that's what my friend, my classmate, Anne, is using here. She's lifting weights on this special machine. This is the same one that we have on the space station. And I'll show you a video of, well, what, of that. This is astronaut Mike Hopkins, and he put together a little, bit, a little video when he was on the space station. So we have a treadmill up there, and you can see you need these bungees to pull you down, because otherwise you would just float away. So he's, you can configure this machine in all these different ways. You can do like 20 different kinds of standard weightlifting stuff you'd do in the gym, like bench presses, or squats, or deadlifts. And then we also have a, a bicycle. So you'll see in the next shot here, when you see the bicycle, see if you can see what's missing. 
There's no seat and there's no handlebars because you don't need that in space. You don't need to sit down. So really, you're just kind of strapped in there and pedaling away. But this is a really important part of our day up there. We, spend we have two hours in our schedule every day to exercise because it's so important in order for us to stay healthy and come back and still function normally like we do here. Like I mentioned, we go on, on hiking trips to practice things like what we call, it's, we have a lot of these acronyms and buzzwords at NASA to kind of make ourselves seem cool, I think, you know? And now we have this buzzword called expeditionary skills training. Basically, it's exactly what your parents and your teachers tell you all the time, how to play nicely with others, how to be a good leader and a good follower, how to take care of all your stuff, you know, make sure you come home with everything that you left with in your backpack, to take care of, of your friends, to be a good team player and to be a good person. And this might seem like basic stuff that you guys learn when you're five years old, but it's really important as astronauts because think about this. If you're going to go to the space station and live in this really small environment with six other people for six months, you really want to go up there with some friends, some people that are going to be nice, that are going to be helpful, that are going to be good team players. And so it's really important for us to practice those kind of skills as well. So in 2015, two years later, after learning all of this stuff, my seven classmates and I graduated, and we stopped. They stopped calling us ASCANs, and they started calling us astronauts. So that was a pretty exciting day for us. And ever since then, we, we do various different jobs all around NASA while we're waiting for our first mission. One of the things that I've done quite a bit of in the last couple of years is to work as a Capcom. Now, I'm sure you guys have seen some space movies. You know that this is a, a picture from the Mission Control Center in Houston. And this is where we control the space station. And this is where we monitor how all the different systems on the space station. And most importantly for me in this job, this is where we talk to the astronauts. So I'm actually sitting at my console with a little headset like I've got on here. And I'm talking to the astronauts in case they're doing an experiment and they have a question or I need to help them with anything. We learn more about science. Um, I'm a biologist, but some of my classmates haven't taken biology since they were your age. So we go over some of that basic stuff to help us when we're up there doing experiments. We do more type of leadership and teamwork type experiences like this one. We fix things. Like I said, if the toilet breaks, I can't call a plumber. So learning how to do everyday maintenance type activities and use all these tools is also a really part, important part of our job. When we're astronauts, we're not just up there as scientists. We're kind of like construction workers, too. So I got to spend two weeks out in this hangar where we keep those NASA T-38s, those jets that we fly. I spent two weeks working with the mechanics and fixing those jets to kind of help practice all of those maintenance skills. We get to fly in various types of aircraft. This is a WB-57. It's a high-altitude aircraft. And you need a pressure suit when you're in this airplane because you're so high up, there's not enough air to breathe, and the pressures are a lot lower. So in order to keep your, keep your body healthy, you've got to wear this pressure suit just in case you had a depressurization in the cockpit. So this is, a, this is really good training to be an astronaut because you can tell this suit looks a lot like that orange suit, the orange suit that you see over here, right? That's what the astronauts were wearing in the, the launch and entry suit that the astronauts were wearing in the space shuttle, right? So it, it, it can inflate and get pressurized in case, in case you need it. So we went up in this aircraft, I went up above 61,000 feet. So not quite space, but almost there. And you can even start seeing a little bit of the curvature of the Earth up there. So really cool experience and really valuable training because you're learning how to operate in this pressurized suit, just like we'll wear when we're in the spacecraft. We also have analog training. So if you're trying to recreate these different aspects of space, you know, we, we can't make everything exactly like space, so what do we do? Here on Earth, we try to find environments that have some things in common. This is a, a picture from the Aquarius habitat. It's an underwater habitat off of the coast of Key Largo, Florida. So it's kind of like the space station. You're in a small volume, you're with a crew, you need a life support system to go outside. In this case, it's scuba gear. And so I got to do this mission back in 2002. This was actually way before I was an astronaut. It was when I worked there as a scientist. You might recognize this guy. That's Scott Kelly, who lived in space recently for a whole year. He's pretty famous these days, but I knew him back when he wasn't. And so we lived underwater for a few days together with Scott and another astronaut, a flight director, and two other guys helping us down there, living and working underwater. And in 2016, I got to do another one of these analogs. And this one's called Caves because we actually got to live in a cave for six days. So we went to Italy and worked with this amazing team of professional cavers. And we 
had all this hardcore training because this was real caving where we had just like kind of like rock climbing with these harnesses because sometimes we would be lowering ourselves down a 75 foot hole. And this was just not a, like a, if you think of a cave, this wasn't just like a hole where we were kind of huddled in and we couldn't move around. This, you came in through one entrance, but there were 25 kilometers of different branches. There's a, one branch had water in it and another branch didn't. And you had all, all of these amazing structures under da underground. And it felt like we were characters in a science fiction illustration or like we were in The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings. I had no idea that there was anything like this beneath the surface of the Earth. This is a picture where we're lowering ourselves down this rope about 75 feet into the darkness. And sometimes you're squeezing through a tiny little hole that you can barely fit through. And other times you come up into this extraordinary gallery with this 100 meter wall. It was really a really cool experience. And my friend Ricky Arnold and I, who was there with me, he actually is on the space station right now, circling above us. He was on this mission with me, and he said, you know, if we put spacesuits on right now and filmed this, we could, we could convince people that we went to Mars. I mean, it really looked like nothing on this planet. But NASA would never do anything like that, don't worry. <laughs> so these are just some other pictures from that cave, and it was really one of the coolest things that I've ever done. And it was also this great experience because we were down there working and functioning as a team. And it was international, too. There was me, there was Ricky, as I mentioned, another American. There was a Spanish astronaut. There was a Japanese astronaut. There was a Russian cosmonaut. And there was even a Chinese taikonaut. That's what they call their astronaut. So it was really cool, just like when we're in space and we're working together with all of these people from all over the world. Most recently, in January, I started training for a mission to the space station. So right now, I'm a backup crew member for an Italian astronaut that's launching next year. I don't have my own launch date yet, but hopefully in the next couple years, I'll be launching to the space station. So I've started doing my training for that, and I'm going back and forth now between Russia and the US to do all that training. Because right now, the space shuttle retired in 2011, and so we're flying with the Russians uh, regularly on their Soyuz rocket. And in, in de December, I got to go there for the first time to watch a launch. And so that's what's happening here. This amazing picture that my friend who's a photographer took, it, this is the rocket. It actually comes out on a little train before, before it gets erected onto the platform. And this is a picture of what the launch looked like. So this is a spacecraft that I'll hopefully be in. Up on the top, there's a little capsule. And that's where the three astronauts and cosmonauts are sitting on their way to the space station. So I've been in Russia training. This is a, a, one of their training, what the trainers of inside that spacecraft, inside that cockpit that I mentioned. And that's what I've been spending all my time doing. Now I get to wear this Russian version of their launch and entry suit. So this is what we'll wear in the Soyuz spacecraft. And it, it fits me a lot better than some of the other ones, too. So I kind of like this one. We did a winter survival training in case the capsule lands. This one, not uh, unlike the Apollo missions that landed in the water, this actually lands on land in the middle of Kazakhstan. So we, we did winter survival training in this spacecraft when I was there to make sure if we land and they can't rescue us right away, we can take care of ourselves and survive until they get there. So I'm going to show you a cool video at the end, but a few, few messages first. I think it's really important to make sure that you find your passion. I can see that there are several of you that have this passion about space already and are already dressed for the job. So maybe you've identified that passion. Maybe your passion is the same as mine. But maybe it's not. Maybe it's going to be being something totally different. Maybe it's to be a teacher. Maybe it's to be an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer or an artist. The thing is, it's really important to find what it is that you love to do and to choose your own path. Everybody's path is completely different. And so I wanted to show you the path that some of my different classmates and I took and all ended up in the same place. These are my seven classmates that I mentioned and myself. And everybody is really different. So it doesn't, you don't have to do what I did. You don't have to go work with penguins. You don't have to be a biologist. Maybe you want to be an engineer. Maybe you want to do something totally different. And this is my classmate, Anne. She used to fly helicopters in the Army. This is my classmate, Nick. And he was a flight test engineer in the Air Force. Victor was a US Navy test pilot. Christina was an electrical engineer. And she went to the Antarctic like I did and helped out with research down there. Josh was a test pilot in the Navy. Drew was a doctor. And all of us ended up in the same path. This is Nicole. She also flew F-18 Hornets in the Marines. So the point here is that there are lots of different ways to accomplish, 
accomplish your dream. And that's really the interesting part. You can go about it in any way that you want. And the important thing is to make sure that you're identifying the one thing that you love and that makes you excited and choose that path. And then you, I think that really is the only way to accomplish those goals. Because in order to be successful at something, you really need to have that passion behind it. And also, most importantly, you need that passion behind it if you want to end up being happy in the end. Another important thing is to make sure that you broaden your perspective. And I like to think about this in, in how you define home. So you might think about home right now. You know, maybe when you go home today, you're going to play outside. You think of your backyard or you think of your room. But take one step back and think about your home from one step further back. This is a picture of your home from the space station. This is a picture of Washington, D.C. at night. Take a step further back from that and think about this. This whole, this planet Earth that we're on right now is home for all of us, not just you, but all the, all the astronauts and the cosmonauts from all the different countries that I talked about. Everybody on this planet, this is our home, and we only have one of them. And this picture, this is an iconic picture that the Apollo astronauts took. Take another step back. Look how far away. Look at your home from another, from another planetary body. And this picture was really important because it gives you that perspective of, Look at this fragile blue ball. It really, we need to protect it. We need to take care of it. And this was really instrumental in the environmental movement as well. So remember that. Remember your perspective and remember what home means to you. Anybody know where this picture was taken from? It was taken from Mars. You know, we haven't had humans on Mars yet. We may in the future, but this was actually taken by one of the rovers. And that tiny little spot where that arrow's pointing, that's Earth. That's your home. So remember that perspective. So I'm going to wrap up and show you this video, because I haven't been to the space station yet, but as I mentioned, I'll be going there in a couple years. And this is going to show you a little bit what, about what it's like to live and work on the space station. So this is that rocket that I mentioned, the Soyuz rocket. That's what the launch looks like. The space station's going around the Earth every 90 minutes. You get to see sunrises and sunsets all day long. That's Robonaut. I got to shake hands with a Honda robot yesterday downstairs, but we have a robot on the space station as well. That's how you wash your hair in space. All kinds of different scientific experiments I mentioned, biology, chemistry, material science, combustion, flames burn differently in space. That's, your, that's really your only pr private space in the space station. That's your sleeping quarters. So we have one of those for each crew member. And you might have some pictures of your family in there. All of those signs say home in a different language. Doma, that's Russian. You have home in Japanese in the middle. That's his home in German. That's a German astronaut, Alex Gerst. Pretty easy to use, move big things in space. And that's the inside of the Russian rocket, the Soyuz. Everybody's kind of crammed in there in those spacesuits. And this is how you land. Like I mentioned, you land on lands in the middle of nowhere. And then the rescue forces come in the helicopters to pull you out. Mike Hopkins is watching his son's hockey game from the space station. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for getting me home. 
He said, thanks for getting me home, Oleg. Even water is fun to play with in space. So thank you very much for being such good listeners today. And I'm going to leave you with this last picture. This is another picture of your home. It's another picture of Washington, D.C. from space, as is this one. Thank you.